I feel like many people, for better or worse, are very much in the know about the Sonic the Hedgehog trilogy on Sega Genesis. Recently, they were re-released as a part of the Sonic Origins collection, and they are some of the most celebrated and acclaimed 2D platformers of their time. With their fast pace and speedy gameplay that puts a distinct emphasis on building momentum to reach the intense speeds that these games advertise, these games struck a chord with millions of people, quickly making Sonic one of the most influential video game characters of all time. That's not to mention how appealing the characters were, how colorful and vibrant the worlds are, and how imaginative and unique the entire concept of this trilogy was, with each game building off the previous one in very clever and natural ways. Nowadays, they do definitely suffer from a few outdated design choices, and there are portions of them that some could view as unfair, but regardless, these are games that are beloved by millions, and are still held in very high regard even 30 years later. However, it might be that very thing that's become probably the most notorious about them. Many of these games are over 30 years old, as previously mentioned, and for pretty much as long as this franchise has existed, people have always judged every single Sonic release off of them, for critics especially. It also should be mentioned that one of the more well-known things about the entire Sonic brand is how the quality of the games and the opinions of said games are very inconsistent. But even with that rule, all three of the Genesis games, as well as Sonic CD, a game released for the Genesis CD add-on, were all consistently agreed upon to be the best games in the series, and to some, they see them as untouchable masterpieces that simply can't be topped. But that's not to say that there wasn't an attempt. In the decades after the trilogy concluded, a lot of 2D Sonic games would come out, many of which just did their own thing and didn't really have much to do with the original trilogy in terms of controls, but there were those very few games that did make an attempt not necessarily to dethrone those games, but at the very least recapture that same magic. However, out of all the games that aim to do that, I don't think that any of them were as direct, or as blatant, or as shameless as the very game that decides to name itself as such, Sonic the Hedgehog 4. Now, this game came out during a very interesting time in the series' history. Sonic 06 and Sonic Unleashed were the latest mainline games at the time, and you don't need me to tell you that these games were tormented and hated by everything under the sun when they came out. It was during times like these where the series' credibility was dead in the water, where the love and nostalgia for the Genesis games grew more than it ever had before. If you were to say that you liked Sonic during the late 2000s, you would almost always follow it up with, oh no, I'm a fan of the old school stuff on Genesis, not any of that 3D garbage. 3D Sonic was seen as a complete joke to the gaming community, and in the midst of all the experimental ideas that they were trying with him, people were starting to miss the more simplistic and lighthearted charm from those earlier games, and wanted those elements of Sonic to return in some way. And yeah, they, they definitely did return, as in 2010, about a month or so away from the next mainline Sonic game, Sonic Colors, Sonic 4 happened. Now, even though this tile screen alone may already be setting off a bajillion red flags, I want to still set the stage a little bit more. When Sonic 4 hit the scene, there are already quite a handful of games that set out to achieve the exact same thing. 2D retro revivals were all the rage back in the late 2000s, and when done right, they can serve as a gigantic burst of momentum for the IP, effectively bringing these dormant franchises back from the dead. In the case of Sonic 4, it prides itself as being the return of 2D Sonic, just like the Genesis games, but with a modernized twist. I guess to start somewhere, these graphics just ain't. I understand that they are trying to modernize the beautiful sprites and environments of those games, but plain and simple, this just looks awful. <laughs> Plasticky and artificial are the two terms commonly thrown at it, but on top of that, the art style is just very inconsistent. The modern Sonic design, placed in these very cheap looking versions of all these classic level aesthetics, just doesn't look right, and it's that same inconsistency that extends to the game itself. Because even though this is a game that markets itself as being Sonic the Hedgehog 4, a game that's supposed to pick up from where the Genesis games left off, there are so many unnecessary and flat out confusing additions that detract from the experience a lot more than they add. 
But above all else, the real reason why Sonic 4 fails at being Sonic 4 is solely due to how much it regresses this beloved formula. Remember, this was supposed to be a sequel to Sonic 3 and Knuckles, a game that introduces so many things, whether it be new moves, new power-ups, entirely new characters with their own exclusive pathways. These were things that expanded the world of Sonic and served to push this formula forward in a meaningful and impactful way. And when you compare it to what we got with Sonic 4, it's just... no. It doesn't matter which angle that you look at from, Sonic 4 is just a straight downgrade, and I know it's the most apparent in terms of how it plays, but like, all the zones are just rehashes from Sonic 1 and 2. There's no new playable characters, something that each of the Genesis games have introduced. Sonic doesn't gain any new moves or abilities, and they actively took away a lot of his moves. Well, to be fair, the homing attack is technically a new move in this context, but if your new move is a wired down version of an attack that you do in a 3D game, you're already kind of in trouble. I'm fully aware that you're a normal average Joe, these things don't really make or break a game, but they do make or break a sequel. Especially if it's a sequel to one of the most acclaimed platformers ever made, new environments and new gameplay additions are essential to making a game like this feel new and exciting and, well, feel like an actual sequel. The gameplay aspect of that is also just as important, which Sonic 4 also fails at. But in my eyes, even if this game did get the momentum down and had good level design, it would still fail at being Sonic 4 because it simply just fails at being a sequel. However, perhaps I'm being a tad bit harsh on this one. As the game straight up says it in the title, this is only PART of the Sonic 4 experience. Strangely enough, Sonic 4 would be released in two episodes, with the second of which being released almost two years after the first. I can't really understand why they made the fans wait so long, but it was during this time where the Genesis games were still considered the only good Sonic games by most people. But after the one-two punch of Sonic Colors and Generations being two of the best reviewing Sonic games at the time, the brand was perceived in a much more favorable light, even by a lot of people who don't identify as Sonic fans. So, now that I've given you the context, I'm now going to make the very controversial statement that Sonic 4 Episode 2 is not only better than Episode 1, but a more competent follow-up to those classic games. For one, just look at this game, man. Look at it! The models are no longer shiny, the lighting is jaw-droppingly gorgeous, and the themes that these levels have are so much more interesting and fresh. White Park might just be my favorite snow level in the entire series, primarily because the aesthetic is just so colorful and exciting and vibrant, it's just plain cool. Tails, the best character in the series, is also here once again, aiding Sonic in his adventure as usual. But this time, Mr. Prower actually allows Sonic to pull off a couple moves that actually contribute to the game in a substantial way. And? Admittedly, that's kind of it in terms of defining traits for Episode 2. Judging it purely off of its graphics and theming alone, Episode 2, at least to me, feels like a successful transition of taking that same graphical style of those classic games and giving them a truly modernized look. But really, even with that, I still think that as a sequel, it still leaves a lot to be desired. Yes, while the aesthetics are incredibly creative and fun, only two of them I can say are completely original. Sylvania Castle and Sky Fortress are again pretty blatant retreads of older levels that do very little to make them stand out on their own terms. However, the reality of the situation is that similarly to Episode 1, even if this game was better put together and its flaws were completely ironed out, it just wouldn't suffice as a sequel. Again, we're comparing it to Sonic 3 and Knuckles, and even though I would argue that this game is an upgrade in terms of how it looks, it simply takes too many things away to be deemed Sonic the Hedgehog 4. I still have to stress that this game was a much more genuine attempt at a follow-up, and I will always admire it for that. But at the end of the day, it fails at being a sequel, and thus, fails at being Sonic 4. Now, given how much was writing on these games at the time, it's no surprise that the Sonic 4 saga wasn't really received that well by much of the fandom. 
In fact, depending on who you ask, some might consider these among some of the worst 2D Sonic games in the entire series. However, perhaps it's thanks to their intensely negative reception that helped start the conversation of what the real Sonic 4 was. There go the entire point of this video. While it is true that this is the official follow-up that we got, people were looking for a game that really felt more like classic Sonic. A game that had the gameplay, the physics, and charm of the original Genesis trilogy, while continuing to modernize and advance the formula into exciting new territory. <laughs> advance. Couldn't come up with a better segue if my life depended on it. In the midst of games that people considered to be the real Sonic 4, one game that would always be brought up was a game that predates this one by nearly 10 years, and was released on one of the greatest handheld systems of all time, the Game Boy Advance. And you'll never guess what they called it. Sonic Advance was released on the GBA during the franchise's 10th anniversary. By that point, the Genesis games weren't that old as the term Classic Sonic didn't even really exist yet, and the series was actually doing pretty well for itself, as both Sonic Adventure 1 and 2 were, at the time, some of the most acclaimed games in the series. So basically, the love for those old games wasn't as strong as it would be a few years down the road, but it was still definitely there. And seeing how many 3D games the series had and would continue to get, Many people simply would have liked just a new 2D Sonic game, just for old time's sake. And lo and behold, a new 2D Sonic game is exactly what we ended up getting. Plain and simple, what you see with Sonic Advance is pretty much what you get. You get the same momentum based gameplay of Sonic 1 through 3, now with the characters more resembling their artwork from the adventure games. Said characters play more or less the exact same as they did in Sonic 3, with each of them gaining new moves, some of which aren't really that good in my opinion, but that's besides the point. Not only that, but we also have a new playable character this time around, Amy Rose, with this being her first playable debut in a 2D game. She's a really cool addition to have. But what's even cooler is that she goes about this game much differently than the other three. Amy's only means of attacking slash defense is her hammer, meaning that the focus is now on how well you can use that hammer to not only go fast, but explore for hidden trinkets and extra goodies. The levels are filled with a bunch of alternate pathways, the music is incredibly bouncy and energetic. If we're judging this purely on how well it emulates the Genesis games, Advance is an awesome tribute to the roots of the series and a loving reminder of where this series came from. But how is it as a sequel though? Well, to give this game credit where it's due, it makes a lot of strides. It kept all the characters and it kept all their moves. It introduced a new character that changes how you play the game completely. There are a lot of things that this game did to advance the formula. But ultimately, where this game falls flat as a follow-up to Sonic 3 is in its level aesthetics. Sonic Advance features six zones, with only one of them having an aesthetic that we haven't seen previously. Every other zone, even if they do cool things with that aesthetic, they just don't feel new or exciting. And if it's a sequel, that feeling of excitement upon seeing something unique is, in my opinion, a must. So in short, no. I don't think that Sonic Advance is the real Sonic 4. And man, that's such a damn shame too because I freaking love this game so much. I'm trying to shy away from giving my personal opinions on these games, but from beginning to almost end, I had the biggest smile on my face while playing this one. It's just such a fun, enjoyable game that has a ridiculous amount of charm in it. Like look at him. Look at him. God, why did they make him so cute? It's also worth mentioning that this game actually got two sequels released shortly after. I don't think I'm alone in saying this, but I wouldn't really count Sonic Advance 2 or 3 to be a part of the real Sonic 4 conversation, given how these games more so do their own thing and don't really use the same mechanics as Sonic 1 through 3. However, with that, let's go forward a couple years to the release of the latest 2D Sonic game, Sonic Mania. Nowadays, when the debate of the real Sonic 4 gets brought up, people are always going to point to Mania as being the one. The game that is simultaneously a great throwback to those older games, while still pushing the formula to heights that's never been able to reach before. Do I agree with this statement? Well, 
first, I should mention that similarly to Sonic Advance, Sonic Mania was positioned as the celebration of the franchise's 25th anniversary. It was revealed at the 25th anniversary event in San Diego, alongside all the performances and all the tech issues, as well as the next mainline Sonic game that we don't talk about. At this point in time, the franchise was in an incredibly strange place. This was the era of Sonic Boom, a sub-series that really doesn't need an introduction at this point. Many people seem to forget that Sonic Boom was the face of the entire brand for nearly two years, and seeing how much of a disaster these games were, it did so much damage to the series to the point where it essentially put it in the exact same spot as it was in the mid-2000s, which would also mean that the Genesis Trilogy was once again deemed as the only good Sonic games alongside Colors and Generations, obviously. I wouldn't really go as far to say that a throwback game like Mania was needed, but after the disaster that was Sonic Boom and the steaming pile of disappointment that would be Sonic Forces, a game like this was definitely welcomed. Like as advertised, this game is about as accurate as 2D Sonic games get in terms of emulating the Genesis game's physics and momentum. However, if there's one thing they need to know about Mania right off the bat, it adds so many things to this formula. Firstly, we got the drop dash, which quite literally changes everything. If you press and hold the jump button in mid-air, Sonic will start to curl faster and faster and perform a dash upon hitting the ground, grant him extra speed. This is probably the coldest take of all time, but this is a move that is right up there with the spin dash in terms of how much it adds to the overall flow of the game. And like the spin dash, it's looking to become a mainstay in every single Sonic game going forward. Tails and Knuckles once again join the fray, alongside two additional characters that this game actually got as DLC, Mighty the Armadillo and Ray the Flying Squirrel. Both characters play considerably differently from the rest of the pack with Mighty coming equipped with a ground pound as well as being able to be impervious to spikes while in a ball form, and Ray being able to pull off a Super Mario World as Glide that can do that. It's pretty clear that in terms of gameplay and in terms of content, Mania is doing quite a bit to evolve the classic Sonic formula, but among those additions, one of the more impactful actually has to do with this game's story, specifically with it being the only game that I've looked at thus far that has an impact on the actual mainline Sonic canon. The entire thing takes place after Sonic 3, with Sonic and Tails returning to Angel Island after picking up this weird energy reading. They go investigate, only to find this swarm of egg robos discovering this magnificent gem known as the Phantom Ruby, a gem that is capable of transporting people across time and space. Now, by itself, this plot device is really interesting in the context of this game, but the thing is, is that it's because of the Phantom Ruby that ultimately links together the events of Sonic Mania with Sonic Forces. <laughs> Alright, I'm gonna make this as quick and painless as possible. So, like in Sonic 1 through 3, Mania has two endings, the true ending being obtained when you get all the Chaos Emeralds and lock Super Sonic. So when you get to the end of the game, you'll find that the Phantom King and Dr. Robotnik are fighting over the Phantom Ruby, and after you ram into them enough times, the Ruby falls out of Robotnik's hand, thus creating another portal that Sonic gets sucked into. And upon traveling through it, it sends him straight into this cutscene from Sonic Forces, effectively making Mania a part of another mainline Sonic game storyline. None of the other contenders in the real Sonic 4 conversation ever even attempted to follow up the mainline games, let alone Sonic 3. And even if it does feel a bit forced and doesn't really flow in as naturally as it should, the fact that it has some sort of canonical relevance to the rest of the series is enough to make this a much stronger follow-up in its own right. I can say with a good degree of certainty that Sonic Mania is far and away the closest that any 2D Sonic game has gotten to living up to the classics. This game is the celebration of all the games, the things, and the characters from that era. And in its simplest terms, it's just plain beautiful. But I said it once, and I'll continue to say it, we are judging these games as sequels, or spiritual successors, I think that's the more appropriate term. And for as much as this game does, for all the things that this game achieves, 
for the majority of its runtime, it's pretty much the polar opposite of what a sequel is. It's still super close, and has, does, and achieved so many things that when you do compare it to Sonic 3, it actually adds just as much, if not even more things to the formula. And I'd even go as far to say that mechanically, yes, this definitely feels like a natural follow-up to those games. However, although all of that is all fine and good, at least for me, feeling like a true spiritual successor to those games ultimately lies if, if what I'm seeing is new. And I've been saying that all throughout this entire video solely because, to me, above getting the momentum down, above having different playstyles, and above having these beautiful high definition graphics, Seeing new landmarks with different enemies and hazards and set pieces that are all completely fresh and original is really the only determining factor for a 2D Sonic game to feel like a successor to those classics. At least for me. Even during those few zones in Sonic Mania, it shows what original aesthetics could do for a classic styled Sonic game, and how exciting and invigorating they are to play through but they only appear four times in the entire game. Like, it really is as simple as this. If Mania was filled exclusively with new zones with the same momentum and mechanics that already has, it'd be the true Sonic 4. If Sonic Advance had completely original themes that are just as lively and charming as the game itself, it'd be the true Sonic 4. If Episode 2 had entirely new and imaginative locations that properly took advantage of the jaw-droppingly gorgeous graphics, it deserved the name of Sonic the Hedgehog 4. Each of these games, in some way or another, achieve at pushing the Genesis formula forward and advancing some aspect of those games in some way. But to me, there are two pieces to this pie, and in terms of following up those games' iconic legacy, you just can't have one piece without the other. But then again, it's all down to your personal opinion. This is a very interesting conversation within the Sonic community, as your criteria for what could be considered the true Sonic 4 could be a lot different. There are tons of people out there that do consider Mania or Sonic Advance to be the true Sonic 4 despite the absence of new stage themes. At the end of the day, I really do find it fun comparing these games to the classics and seeing how much they have in common with them. But given how I've been talking about 2D Sonic this entire time, I think it's time to address the elephant in the room here. Sonic Superstars. <gasps> Announced in June of this year during Summer Games Fest, Sonic Superstars is it. As a game, Superstars is legit every possible thing I could have wanted out of a 2D Sonic game like this. But as a spiritual successor to those fabled Genesis games, Superstars seems to be exactly what I was looking for all this time. All of the strides that each of the three previously mentioned games had looks to be present within this game. The gameplay and momentum from Mania looks to be mostly intact, the game has 4 playable characters like in Sonic Advance, and even though I think that the graphical style is a bit simplified compared to Episode 2, it still has some beautiful HD graphics that really makes this formula feel modern. But by far, the biggest thing that has been confirmed about this game is that there will be zero returning zones. Every single level within the game is going to be filled with entirely original concepts that the 2D series has never seen before. And there are 12 of them! There are 12. 12 new and inspired zones in this thing, effectively making it just as long as Sonic 3. And, judging by this screenshot, there seems to be a fifth playable character, presumably someone who is entirely new to the cast. I just... Oh, this game looks so freaking good man it's just there's just so much that i've seen from this game and read about this game that just gets me excited probably the most excited that i've ever been for any sonic game Ugh, and there's new special stages and the chaos terminals can give you power-ups that you can use within the levels themselves oh my god i i i might have gotten a little bit sidetracked there all this praise and excitement is fueled by a lot of things, but chief among them is the fact that this game looks exactly like the Spiritual Sonic 4, or even just a Spiritual Sonic 3 follow-up that I've been clamoring for. 
It looks to use the classic characters and mechanics not to bring the series back to its roots, but to expand and elevate the momentum based gameplay that these Genesis games were known for to new heights. And it's thanks to that fact alone, why even if the game doesn't turn out the way that I hoped, or even if it's a completely unplayable buggy mess, at least in spirit, Sonic Superstars will always be my prime example of what it means to be Sonic the Hedgehog 4.